He later went on to do his PhD in biology from the University of Rochester in New York in 1999. Professor Malik studies genetic conflict, the competition between genes and proteins with opposing functions that drives evolutionary change. The Genetic Society, the Genetic Society of America awarded him one of the society's top honors, the Edward Novitsky Prize for his extraordinary creativity and intellectual ingenuity in genetic research. He was awarded the 2008 Presidential Early Career Award for scientists and engineers. He also brought the 2010 Velsic Prize for Creative Promise in Biomedical Science to his credit. The 2017 Eli Lilly Prize in Microbiology, which is the most prestigious award awarded by the American Society of Microbiology, added one more feather to his cap. There is no doubt that this is going to be a very interesting and enlightening session. So kindly keep your microphones muted and video switched off all through the session. I request you to keep your questions for the end so that we can have a very fruitful interactive session at the end of the talk. And now I would like to hand over the virtual mic to Professor Malik. That's all from my side. Thank you. Thank you very much to Proteus and all the students who've logged in at this very late hour to listen to me um, far away from Seattle. Um, let me just start sharing my slides and you can let me know if uh, things start showing up on your screen. Are things showing up on your screen all right? Okay, um, I'm going to assume that uh, things are showing up and you can still hear me. Today, I'm actually going to tell you about one half of the focus of research in my lab, which um, involves host virus interactions. This is a topic that all of us are acutely aware of its importance, uh, especially over the last two years. All the work that I'm going to describe today is primarily the work of a current postdoc in the lab, Jeanette Tenthore. And if I have time, I'll also briefly tell you about the work from a former graduate student, Rosala Kolodtiji. All the work in my lab is actually involving genetic conflicts. This concept of genetic conflicts actually owes its roots to a pretty unusual source, which is the character, the Red Queen, introduced to us by Lewis Carroll in his book, Through the Looking Glass, in which the Red Queen says to Alice, upon Alice's complaint that they've been walking for a long time and not getting anywhere, the Red Queen replies that in Wonderland, it takes all the running you can do to keep in the same place. Um, in the context of the book, of course, it's a very memorable line and it's a very memorable book for those of you who haven't read it. But this was actually seized upon as a really important theorem by a number of evolutionary biologists at the time, including Lee Van Whalen, who coined this as the Red Queen hypothesis, pointing out that for species to be successful in their environment, it was not just sufficient for them to adapt to their abiotic environment, let's say temperature or weather conditions, but it was also important for them to adapt, to keep pace with the changing strategies of all the other species in that environment that were potentially competing for fitness space in that particular ecosystem. So for example, um, in this cartoon example, the, the fate of the snow leopard population is not simply dependent on how snow leopards deal with the cold, but also how do they keep pace with the changing camouflage strategies of the snow hares and so on and so forth. This has actually been a transformative theorem in evolutionary ecology, but what labs like mine uh, are trying to do is try to adapt this into a mole more molecular sense to try to get a sense of how such kinds of arms races or genetic conflicts between competing species have changed the nature of our own genomes. And today I'm actually going to uh, tell you about a very simple uh, conflict that you can easily imagine is very much like the prey-predator conflict that I described on my previous slide, and this involves an antiviral protein. And today I'm only going to focus on innate antiviral proteins that recognizes some feature of a virus uh, that enters the cell. And by virtue of that recognition will mediate its uh, antagonism or what we refer to colloquially as will restrict the virus from going through the rest of its life cycle. As a result, the host is temporarily winning this arms race. This puts a lot of evolutionary pressure on the viral population to evolve new states such that they are no longer capable of being recognized by the antiviral protein. Temporarily now, the virus is winning this arms race because it has escaped detection and therefore restriction from the uh, existing antiviral protein. 
This, of course, puts evolutionary pressure back onto the host to evolve new versions of the antiviral proteins to essentially, again, reestablish their antagonism of the virus. Now, what's really interesting is that this is an arms race that is being primarily playing out at the level of binding affinity um, between these two components. Um, if binding affinity is high and, and rapid, then the uh, host is going to win. If binding affinity is low, then the virus is going to win. I hope you can appreciate that the virus has tremendous advantages here because it can evolve much more rapidly than the host, but also it has very large effective population sizes um, compared to the host. However, it's not just one host protein that the virus needs to contend with, but actually we have uh, nearly 200 proteins that are dedicated to the task of uh, interrogating a virus that enters the cell and blocking it. And for the host to be successful, it really only needs to win one of these uh, interactions, whereas for the virus to be successful, it needs to run the entire gauntlet of all of these antiviral proteins to be successful. And therefore the math uh, kind of um, evens out which is one of the reasons why we are all here, in spite of the fact that our genetic ancestors probably encountered a number of pathogenic viruses in our past. I would also like to point out that from the perspective of an antiviral protein, it's not just encountering one kind of virus, but many kinds of different pathogenic viruses in their lifetime. And so this is really a polynomial interaction or a many-to-many -many interaction. But even if we simplify it like I have into a one-to-one -one interaction between one host protein and one virus protein, what I hope you can appreciate is that this is a relentless engine for evolution. And what drives this engine is the fact that one party, either the host or the virus, is on the losing side. Therefore, there's always going to be an evolutionary advantage to gain by innovation to reestablish their dominance in these arms races. There's many ways to study this kind of innovation, but what labs like mine do is we look backwards in the sequences of both host and viral proteins to essentially um, reconstruct the evolutionary events that led to the present day states of both host and viral proteins and try to understand how these arms races played out over the course of millions of years of evolution. So one form that we can actually use to study this kind of innovation is in protein coding genes. Um, I understand that many of you are not evolutionary biologists, so this is a very brief primer for many of you um, who are sort of used to thinking about this um, just right now, which is that if you were to imagine a protein coding gene that I've cartooned here with three codons that encodes these three amino acids, you can imagine that all uh, nucleotide substitutions that uh, can occur in this site are either those that will not alter the amino acid being encoded, so-called silent or synonymous changes, and we normalize this number to the possible number of uh, total possible number of changes as ds, or other changes that instantly alter the protein product of this protein coding gene, and we call these non-synonymous or replacement changes. Now, what's uh, important is to emphasize that mutation, being a chemical process, cannot distinguish between these two uh, types of changes. However, natural selection can instantly see these changes because they've altered the final pro protein product, whereas these changes are more or less silent um, for most uh, natural selection processes. As a result, these kinds of changes are uh, likely to accumulate in almost like a clock-like fashion, where the uh, greater the number of years of divergence, the higher the DS value, whereas the fate of these uh, replacement changes really depends on whether natural selection favors or disfavors them. So for example, many of you are used to looking at alignments of protein coding domains, and your eyes actually drawn to the positions that are completely conserved in evolution. What effectively you're doing is you're making a mathematical calculation uh, of identifying sites in which the apparent rate of amino acid replacement is much less than the apparent rate of silent changes. In other words, a lot of amino acid changes probably occurred by the process of mutation, but they were deemed deleterious and purified out of the population by natural selection. Hence the term purifying selection because natural selection has acted to purge uh, the population of these amino acid replacement changes. <laughs> Another very simple way to say what I just said is that we use high evolutionary conservation of amino acid residues or protein domains to infer that they must be important for function. So if you're trying to make a mutation in a protein coding gene, you're much more likely to target a highly conserved residue rather than a very rapidly evolving residue. 
However, we make this sort of uh, false assumption sometimes that just because something is not conserved in evolution, it must not be important. In fact, my entire lab actually studies cases in which the apparent rate of amino acid changes is actually much higher than what we would expect based on the mutation rates. And this occurs because natural selection has acted to accelerate the rate of fixation of these uh, non-synonymous changes because they were presumably beneficial in the context that they occurred. So we use the term positive selection because this has actually been favored by natural selection. And just like high conservation is a proxy for functional importance, this constant relentless innovation is also a proxy for functional importance, but this one is about importance in uh, genetic conflicts like the ones that I'm describing today. Just to give you a sense to intuitively think about what I'm talking about for these two types of selection regimes, let's imagine two host proteins that interact with each other and their interaction is really important, let's say because of a signaling cascade. Now, because of this importance of this interaction, any mutations that occur in either one or the other protein that perturb the interaction are likely not to be allowed in natural selection. So you could come back millions of years later and you'll identify that purifying selection has really maintained the amino acid residues at the interaction interface between these two proteins. In contrast, for host virus arms races, it's actually to the benefit of the host to maintain the interaction, but not to the benefit of the virus. So the, the system is going to bounce back and forth between binding affinity and escape from binding affinity. Here again, we have a protein interaction interface, but this one is being constantly modeled and remodeled by rapid amino acid changes as both of these entities why for evolutionary importance. What I hope you can appreciate is that we do not expect this battle for amino acid replacements to be occurring randomly over the, uh, over the surface of these proteins. We expect those changes to be maximally concentrated on residues that dictate the binding affinity between these interactions. And with this kind of idea, we can also look at all of the protein coding genes in the genome and ask, what are the types of genes in which DNDS is much less than one or greater than one? And unsurprisingly, the vast majority of protein coding genes are actually evolving under purifying selection, which sort of makes intuitive sense because if you were to make a random mutation in a protein coding gene, there's actually a higher chance that you're going to uh, reduce function rather than improve function. Yet there are also this handful of genes that where even on a whole gene average, DNDS actually exceeds one. And unsurprisingly, innate immune genes are heavily overrepresented in this unusual category of positively selected genes, where we really need relentless innovation so we can keep pace with the changing pathogens that are encountered by the immune system. So we sort of can start with the assumption that if we were to imagine that positive selection is not randomly distributed as a result of these arms races, but instead concentrated on the sites that maximally affect binding affinity between these two states, we wondered whether we could use positive selection as a proxy to identify specificity domains or interaction surfaces between these hosts and viral proteins, even in the absence of uh, uh, some underlying biochemistry. So could we use this evolution-guided approach to understand uh, how host and virus interaction surfaces um, evolve. And it turns out that this is a remarkably successful strategy, but it also actually tells us something quite nice about susceptibility determinants. In other words, why one species um, of primates, let's say, is exquisitely specific to a pathogenic virus, whereas a sister species is completely uh, resistant. And this turns out not to be because our immune genes are completely different. It actually turns out that our, our immune genes are very similar but the specificity tuning of our immune genes is quite different because of the different history of pathogenic viruses that have been encountered by both of these entities. And what's really nice is that we can change the specificity tuning simply by making single amino acid residue changes at these putative interaction surfaces and sort of reestablish changes. So for example, if we were to take a primate uh, version of an antiviral protein, and that's what I'm gonna show you today, and essentially graft in just a single amino acid residue into a human protein, we can essentially confer uh, this primate uh, resistance to this virus onto the human protein. What's really nice about this kind of approach, because it's general and evolutionally inspired, it actually works for a completely different uh, panoply of uh, innate immune genes, all of which have completely different enzymatic functions and domains. And it actually also works against a completely different classes of viruses. 
But what they all have in common is the fact that binding affinity of the host antiviral proteins and the viral proteins seems to be the primary rate limiting determinant of whether the virus infection is going to be successful, both on a cellular level as well as on an organismal level. If you're interested in hearing a little bit more about the general principles underlying this approach, there's this annual reviews of genetics article that I'd, I'd encourage you to look up. I think it's actually freely accessible uh, for you guys in the audience. So I want to go a little bit deeper with one of these case studies in which we focused on a single antiviral protein called TRIM5-alpha. TRIM5-alpha was actually discovered because rhesus macaques and other macaque species, even if you were to inject them with HIV-1, they do not get infected. Um, with, they can actually clear the virus. In contrast, if we were to inject a human being with this virus, um, then of course we basically have this uh, infection that can progress to AIDS. And actually, it turns out that there's actually a very important single gene called TRIM5-alpha that is the, the difference between these two species. So when the HIV-1 virus enters the cell, it sheds its membrane envelope onto the cell surface and enters with this protein capsid-like domain. If you were to imagine, this is almost like the panels of a spaceship that is entered, protecting uh, what is carried underneath, which is the um, RNA genome of the virus. What TRIM5 will do is that if it can rapidly recognize this uh, proteinaceous capsid, it will form this lattice-like structure around this capsid and rapidly degrade it, thereby preventing the virus from going through the rest of its life cycle. If this interaction of TRIM5 with the capsid is fast enough and avid enough, this basically completely blocks the virus infection in its tracks. However, if this interaction is not very rapid, then the virus is actually going to go on to be successful. And it turns out that the human TRIM5-alpha is too slow to mount a meaningful biological protection, whereas rhesus TRIM5 is very, very rapid. Based on this paradigm of back and forth evolution between host uh, TRIM5 proteins and the capsid proteins on the virus side, we actually identified just a very small patch of the TRIM5 protein, um, just these residues, 12 residues out of a 600 amino acid protein in which TRIM5 has rapidly evolved in the course of primate evolution. So once again, you can see here, human TRIM5 is actually very weakly protective against HIV-1. This is not biologically meaningful. Whereas rhesus uh, TRIM5 uh, provides 100-fold protection um, in cell infections with HIV-1, which is very biologically protective. What's really remarkable is that even though this is a 600 amino acid protein, if we were to simply swap in this V1 loop from rhesus into a human TRIM5 backbone, we can essentially confer um, almost rhesus-like protection against HIV-1, you can see that. And even more remarkably, just a single amino acid residue change at one of these positively selected positions into the human backbone is sufficient to give you 15-fold better protection, which would be actually biologically protective. So if there were human beings kind of walking around the planet um, that have these particular residue changes at these uh, critical positions, they would actually be biologically protected against HIV-1. I'll just preempt the question that's, uh, and say that we have looked very, very hard to identify um, polymorphisms in this V1 loop, and all human beings are monomorphic, which means we all actually have exactly the same residues and are equally susceptible to the HIV-1 virus. So what about these uh, six residues that I told you are very rapidly evolving in this type V1 loop? Uh, we decided to take a look at their evolutionary history across simian primates, and what was kind of surprising is that it was not that we were seeing this back and forth evolution very, very rapidly. Instead, there were these small sort of idiosyncratic epochs in which changes had actually occurred um, over the course of uh, TRIM5's evolution in primates. So this leads to the question that maybe one of the reasons we see very few changes at these critical positions is because helpful mutations are just very rare. Alternatively, it's possible that actually helpful mutations are not very rare, but these are just the mutations that uh, evolution has actually encountered over the course of primate evolution. Now, looking at these primate sequences, we don't actually have the means to distinguish between these possibilities because we are looking at TRIM5 sequences that have undergone both mutation and natural selection. But taking advantage of synthetic biology approaches, we can actually separate these events and ask what is the landscape of adaptation that is possible in the human TRIM5 sequence. So you can imagine on this XY axis in this 3D plot, uh, 
Um, this is the sequence space that can be explored by TRIM5 by single mutations, uh, whereas the height of the peaks here reflect their antiviral uh, activity. So for example, human TRIM5 sits in a valley because it's actually very poorly protective against um, uh, HIV-1, whereas rhesus TRIM5 might sit on one of these peaks. Um, and so what we are very interested in is how much uh, mutation does it take to take human TRIM5 up one of these peaks and become really protective against HIV-1? Is it very frequent or is it very rare? Um, whereas, uh, does rhesus TRIM5 sit on one of these rolling hill-like peaks or one of these very, very sh sharp peaks where any single additional mutation is likely to throw you off this cliff, which is also going to be very important in terms of how TRIM5 battles um, pathogenic viruses such as HIV. So to do this question, what we basically did was we adopted a deep mutational scanning approach. Many of you probably heard about these approaches um, in your reading. What we do is instead of mutagenizing the entire TRIM5 protein, we actually only mutagenize the uh, 10 to 11 amino acid uh, residues that are in the V1 loop. But we basically introduce all possible single amino acid changes at every one of these particular positions. Um, and by virtue of this PCR mutagenesis, we are basically exploring all single amino acid changes that are possible um, at the V1 loop. And what we do is we actually then introduce this library into cat cells. Uh, we choose cat cells for both historical reasons, but also because of the fact that both cat and dog cells happen to have a mutant uh, or pseudogenized version of TRIM5. So they're incapable of encoding their own TRIM5. As a result, when we provide selection with puromycin, we are essentially selecting for cat cells that each of them is now encoding a slightly different variant version of human TRIM5. Um, and what we now want to know is ask whether these variant versions of TRIM5 confer better or worse protection against HIV-1. And so to do that experiment, we infected this library of cells, each encoding a different variant of TRIM5, with an HIV-1 virus that is modified so that it can only encode GFP upon integration. And we do this at what we call a high MOI or a high multiplicity of infection because we basically want to maximize the level of infection in this uh, cell population. As a result of this infection, we are basically going to end up with three types of cells. Uh, many cells, in fact, most cells, we presume would be non uh, would turn green because they do not have the ability to protect against HIV-1 infection and integration into the genome. We are actually more interested in the non-green cells because these cells are probably non-green because they have some sort of biological uh, protection of HIV-1, suggesting that the TRIM5 variant encoded in these cells was actually protective against HIV-1. Of course, we cannot rule out the possibility that these non-green cells just happen to be lucky enough to not be infected in the first round of infection. And these cells also encode TRIM5, but that is completely irrelevant to their protection uh, status. So we wanted to distinguish between these two types of non-green cells. So we took all the non-green cells from the first round and we subjected them to a second round of HIV-1 infection, again, at a high multiplicity of infection. And now all the cells that remain non-green are very unlikely to have escaped infection in both rounds of infection. And they're more likely to actually encode uh, restrictor versions or antiviral potent versions of TRIM5. And so the way we do this is we do this all in a pool of cells. So what we are doing at the end is we are going to sequence the TRIM5 variants from all of these non-green cells and compare them to the sequence of all of the TRIM5 variants in this population of cells to identify whether there is any kind of enrichment for TRIM5 variants that are now more likely to be restrictor or antivirus. What's really nice is that we can do some sanity checks along the way. One of the sanity checks that we are really interested in um, is to see whether the biological replicates match. And luckily for us, they do. You can see that the, uh, the top variant in uh, um, replicate one is also the top variant in replicate two, which is exactly what you'd like to see. Um, what's also kind of nice is that if you were to do this waterfall plot, which is sort of how we uh, describe this kind of uh, representation, where the enrichment in the restrictor pool, which means the higher you are or the more to the left you are, um, the more likely you are to be protective against HIV-1. You can see that wild type human TRIM5 actually has very weak protection. It's very much towards the left, but nonetheless, it's still much better than versions that have introduced stop codons 
as a as a function of our introduced PCR mutagenesis strategy. So even though uh, wild type human trim five is very weak against HIV one, we can still distinguish it from the trim five variants that are basically containing truncation mutations. So we needed to study some of these variants in more detail just to sort of make sure that we were actually getting true enrichment. So to do that, what we did was we chose a few variants and then we expressed them individually into the same cat cells and infected them with increasing doses of HIV-1 virus. So in the absence of any TRIM5 whatsoever, you can see that it actually takes this much virus to infect 10% of the cells and eventually all the cells, 100% of them will be infected. But in the presence of human TRIM5, you can see that it now takes a little bit more virus to infect 10% of the cells. And this difference at the 10% infection level is our metric for fold restriction or providing a function of how much better protection is provided by human TRIM5 compared to an empty vector control. Um, in the same assay, even though I'm not showing it here, if Rhesus TRIM5 was included, it would be very much to the right because it's much better protected um, against um, HIV-1. Nonetheless, there would be a particular viral dose at which even Rhesus TRIM5 um, is overwhelmed by the HIV-1 virus that we've actually introduced. What's really nice is that these, this assay is now done with individual viral variants. So you've got full restriction of selected variants this assay is actually done in a mixed pool of all possible TRIM5 variants. And these beautifully, again, correlate with each other. And in particular, the variant I told you about already with a single amino acid mutation um, in the V1 loop is actually one of the top variants that we covered. Again, really justifying our strategy to identify not just single variants, but all possible variants um, that are capable of restricting HIV-1 virus. So returning to this waterfall plot that you've already seen before, one of the remarkable findings of this analysis is not just that this analysis works really well in this pooled assay, but what we find is that 57% of all random single mutations in the V1 loop actually improve HIV-1 restriction over the current wild-type version of human TRIM5. So it, you, you might be uh, presuming that, okay, I'm actually starting with a human TRIM5 that's quite weak, but I'm exploring random sequence space, so you're more likely to get worse than better. But in fact, what we see is the opposite. You're actually more likely to get better um, than worse if you were to make these random mutations. So we wanted to understand what explains the, the, the you know, lack of rarity of these gain-of-function mutations. And so to do, do that, um, we basically explored what is the biochemical nature of the mutation that we see? So once again, here's the sequence of the V1 loop from human trim 5 alpha. These arrowheads indicate the positions that are under positive selection or very rapidly evolving. And here you can actually see all the possible 20 amino acids that we could include, including uh, a stop codon as the 21st uh, column because uh, we are introducing a number of stop codons as a virtue of our um, mutagenesis strategy. And I hope you can actually appreciate that it's not that there is a completely random pattern here, but instead we can easily discern rows and columns. In particular, the position that was already mutated to proline turns out to be actually a really cool position because we have an arginine in human trim 5 alpha, but any amino acid residue other than arginine would actually be beneficial um, in this context. Similarly, we have a second arginine at position 335, and here again, um, the, any residue other than an arginine would be beneficial because the bluer you are in this assay, the better protective uh, you are against HIV-1. Similarly, you can see that, uh, so arginine are positively charged amino acids. If you were to actually look at just the columns of the negatively charged amino acids that indicate aspartic acid or glutamic acid, you can see that practically for all positions, any residue towards an acidic residue is actually a gain of function. So it actually turns out that even though there's a, all of this kind of gain of function restriction, we can actually explain almost all of this gain of function by this very simple metric of the net charge of the V1 loop. So we have the wild type trim five has actually got a net charge of plus two. Obviously stop codons are much worse at protection. You can actually uh, further reduce restriction by getting uh, even additional uh, positive charge, but you can see that as you get less and less positive charge, you get better and better protected against HIV-1. So why could this be happening? Remember, 
TRIM5 is actually directly interacting with the capsid of the HIV-1. So what we think is actually going on is that the positive charge on the V1 loop is actually having some sort of charge repulsion with the presumably positively charged loop on the HIV-1 capsid protein. And by reducing this charge, we've essentially lowered the probability of this repulsion and therefore improved the restriction potential. Now, what's really cool about this is that um, we've actually known about this protein for nearly 20 years. But this kind of analysis that charge repulsion is actually going on has never really even entered our mind. And it's only when we do this kind of comprehensive analysis that this pattern really kind of comes out screaming um, as a conclusion for what might be actually limiting TRIM5 evolution in this uh, regard. So coming back to this, uh, it turns out that human TRIM5 and as well as chimpanzee and bonobo have basically two uh, residues, uh, which arginine, and if we actually had anything other than an arginine at these positions or a lysine at these positions, we would be actually much better protected against HIV-1, which is a pretty sobering kind of reminder of the role that idiosyncrasy or stochasticity plays in terms of determining our susceptibility to different viruses. It still begs the question, though, that why would we actually favor the fixation of residues that would actually lower our ability to interact with viruses? We actually considered the possibility that even though we tested just HIV-1, maybe these double arginines are beneficial against other classes of SIVs that might have been encountered over the course of primate evolution. And so it, to test that, we tested a bunch of these SIVs for all of the variants we had. And it actually turns out that the wild type human TRIM5 is actually the weakest in terms of fold restriction compared to all of the variants that actually improve um, this charge repulsion. So it turns out we can actually pretty conclusively rule out the hypothesis that some other ancestral SIV related virus was the reason we fixed these double arginines. Instead, what we think is actually going on and something we are actually working on is that TRIM5 also has this uh, important role in triggering other forms of immunity. And if you actually have this uh, immunity triggered uh, on a hair trigger, there's a very high risk of autoimmunity, whereas the double arginines in a way provide better control and actually might actually protect us against autoimmune effects of TRIM5 rather than actually protect against other viruses in the first place. So this is something that we are actively studying right now. So I, again, want to return to this uh, sort of re remarkable evolutionary finding that random mutations in this potential interaction loop are more likely to improve restriction rather than reduce restriction. So many single mutations can improve restriction. So this is, of course, with human TRIM5, which is already weak, and we are basically improving it. We wanted to turn the same assay now uh, on its head and say, OK, what if we were to start with the rhesus, which is already very good, is rhesus very, very susceptible to losing its restriction because of single mutations? Or is it on one of these rolling hill landscapes where single mutations are not likely to take you off the cliff of a high HIV-1 restriction? So we once again do exactly the same assay that I described, but this, this time we are now doing this in a rhesus trim 5 backbone, and we are mutating its V1 loop comprehensively. We once again introduce a rhesus trim 5 variant library in cat cells. But this time, we are actually interested in identifying variants that lose HIV-1 restriction. So we are actually not interested in the non-green um, cells. We are interested in the green cells that became green because the rhesus trim 5 protection against HIV-1 was lost. And that is now we are in, enriching for the lack of restriction or for non-restrictors. So once again, we have this beautiful waterfall plot where now to the left, we have enrichment for non-restrictors. And as you might guess, all of the stop codon or truncation mutations are very highly represented in the non-restrictors because they're loss of function. I already told you that a wild type rhesus trim 5 is very good. And so it's you know very much to the right-hand side because it's extremely protective against HIV-1. But the remarkable finding here is that 51% of random mutations of the V1 loop are just as good as rhesus trim 5, which means even though we're taking a naturally occurring trim 5 variant that is good against um, HIV-1 restriction, random mutations of the V1 loop have not actually further diminished the ability for this antiviral protein to protect against viruses. Instead, it's actually quite resilient uh, to additional mutations.
So we wanted to ask the question, is restriction generally mutationally resilient? And so if you were to recall, um, I had pointed out that even though human TRIM5 has very poor protection, human TRIM5 with just a single amino acid mutation that is engineered is actually very strongly protective against HIV-1. So we now took this, this particular version of human TRIM5 with this uh, fixed mutation at uh, proline at this particular position, and now did again a deep mutational scan. Um, but this time, instead of the wild type human TRIM5 with this particular mutation fixed in the genome, and once again, just like what we saw with rhesus, what we find is that 65% of additional missense mutations are just as protective um, uh, or even better than this um, arginine 332p mutation. So that means that whether this is a naturally occurring resistance to the virus or an engineered resistance to the virus that we've engineered with single amino acid mutations, they're both very robust, uh, that they're not likely to lose antiviral protection um, just because of additional mutations, which you, if you think about it, is a very valuable tool um, you know, when you're facing a rapidly evolving pathogenic virus such as HIV-1. This is not just something that is uh, true just for HIV-1. We did the same kind of assay um, against entropic murine leukemia virus. And once again, you can see that rhesus trim 5 is very, very protected. And human trim 5 which is remarkable, 92% of its missense mutations are just as good. In fact, the only mutations that we can robustly say lost function uh, were the ones that actually contained um, stop code on mutations here. So just to summarize what I've shown you here, we basically are deeply profiling the, the evolutionary landscape of mutations in this loop that we identified initially completely based on its evolutionary rapid evolution but now we know that this is actually a biochemically important domain for restriction. But what we've shown is that this um, important loop is actually quite mutationally robust. That means it's not likely to lose its antiviral function uh, because of further mutations in this. Why is this important? Well, it turns out that not only are the winning solutions not rare, like I showed you with human trim 5 random mutations can easily confer gain of function. But once you acquire these winning uh, solutions, they're not actually very fragile. You're not um, in this very risky cliff where you're basically likely to fall off the cliff with additional mutations. Instead, you can actually really take advantage of the existing mutations and yet evolve um, new specificities. This is actually quite different than what others have found with deep initial scanning of traditional protein-protein interactions, um, like enzyme um, interactions or signal transduction cascades, where what people find is that there's actually just a few sites that are key for this lock and key-like mechanism of protein interaction. And any mutations at those sites mean that you're actually likely to lose function. Instead, what we are actually seeing at uh, antiviral proteins like TRIM5 is that more of these rolling hill-like landscape where they have these flat plateaus where once you sit on, on here, you can actually walk around for quite some distance before you're likely to fall off. And this is likely to be quite beneficial when you're facing um, pathogens such as HIV-1 that are rap likely to be rapidly evolving. So just to summarize, what I've shown you here is that by taking this approach, which separates the effects of mutation from natural selection, what we found is that most mutations do not break restriction. So you can actually generate additional standing variation in the population without actually additional cost, which is actually a huge advantage in these host virus interactions. But also what's kind of really neat is that it shows that novel restriction is quite easy to gain by single mutation. So we are actually poised to you know, evolve to new specificities just by single amino acid mutations. So some of you are biochemistry uh, minded people. So I'm sure the question that you're also thinking is, why is this so different for proteins like TRIM5 compared to the kind of lock and key strict requirement mechanisms that people have shown for other proteins involved in say signal transduction? It actually turns out that those other proteins are involving uh, interaction surfaces that are extremely uh, stable and relatively slowly evolving. Instead, what we have is the V1 loop of TRIM5 alpha is actually a disordered loop compared to the rest of the uh, TRIM5 uh, protein, which means that it's not actually acquiring just one structural uh, domain. It's in fact represented by an ensemble of potentially flexible structural domains, making it a lot more resilient, but also allowing it to adopt multiple different conformations, at least some of them that are capable of now recognizing 
newly evolved versions of viruses, which is a huge advantage. So the, the difference between a traditional protein-protein interaction domain um, versus antiviral proteins like TRIM5 is that these interaction domains are very rapidly evolving themselves, and they actually involve a lot of protein disorder to accommodate a lot of evolutionary flexibility. If you think that you've actually seen this theme before, almost certainly you have, because this is exactly the same principle by which uh, protein antibodies actually work, where we've got this very, very ordered uh, backbone of the antibodies that's very, very slowly evolving. But the antigen recognition loops, the loops that are actually quite rapidly changing when your body is actually facing a new viral pathogen or when you get vaccinated and you're trying to... Uh, improve your uh, adaptive immunity against um, incoming viruses. Basically, what is happening is that these loops are actually evolving in the course of your lifetime to now adapt and get better at their avidity to this uh, incoming pathogen. And again, these loops are disordered and they're actually quite robust to mutation. So they're not likely to lose function, allowing them the ability to explore evolutionary landscapes to gain function. I just want to leave you because I won't have time to tell you about our MX studies, but I encourage you to look that up, is that this is not just something we've seen for TRIM5 alpha. This might be actually a rule that we see for innate immune proteins, where once again, we've got most of the protein that is extremely stably kind of structured, but the bulk of the rapid evolution is actually uh, concentrated in these disordered loops that represent novel interaction domains for the viruses to actually um, interact with um, these innate immune proteins and, and potentially be restricted. And the reason this is actually potentially really important is that this provides both evolutionary fl flexibility as well as adaptive potential, allowing these uh, antiviral proteins that are really slowly evolving because they're actually encoded in the germline, unlike your antibody repertoires, which can change over the course of your lifetime to keep pace with the very rapidly changing um, adaptive strategies of viral proteins. So I think I'll stop there and I'll just give a brief acknowledgement uh, slide before I take your questions. Um, all the work that I described to you, I'm an evolutionary biologist by training. I'm really interested in a number of interesting evolutionary questions from host pathogen interactions um, to chromosome evolution, which I, you know, maybe I'll tell you about that on a future date. But all of the work that I did here was actually the result of a collaboration with my colleague, Michael Emmerman who really is a bona fide virologist. And we've actually co-mentored a number of people. That's actually how it works a lot uh, at my institution, where PhD students have two mentors um, and, and basically take the expertise of both of their mentors. All of the work that I told you today is actually uh, done primarily by Jeanette Tentere. I didn't have a chance to tell you about our work with MXA, but it's actually published. I'd love for you to read it. And if you have any questions, you can um, feel free to shoot me an email. So thank you very much. I think I'll stop here and stop sharing. So thank you, sir. That was an extremely insightful and a delightful talk indeed. Uh, so now I would like to invite questions from the audience. And uh, we have a question in the chat box. So Ira Sibu, do you like to read it out? If you're online. Uh, no, I was going to ask you if TRIM5 was species specific, but you had answered that later on in your presentation. So. All right, cool. Cool, fine. Uh, so now I would like to invite any questions from the audience. And um, I think it would be great if you can switch on your cameras, uh, like when you're asking the question, so we can have a better interaction. But I also want to say that I know that it's almost midnight there. So if you feel like you're like ready to go to bed, it's totally OK to ask me the question without the camera, too. I'll be very cognizant. I'm sitting in a very messy room, so I have a fake uh, background myself. So. Okay. Any any questions? Hello, sir. This is Santoshi. Yes. Uh, so you have talked about gain of function mutation. So how this is achieved in in vivo condition uh, while treating HIV, and how effective this would be? Yeah, that's an excellent question. So right now, we don't actually have a very, very reliable way to do this for all uh, kinds of cells. But actually, for HIV-1, there's already phase two trials underway in which stem cells are actually being genetically modified before they are reintroduced into patients. And there are two types of modifications that are actually happening in these stem cells. Um, so since uh, HIV usually infects CD4 um, and CD8 cells, 
what we can do is we can essentially replenish um, a patient with uh, his own cells that are now engineered to be resistant um, to the HIV virus. And it's made resistant by two changes. One is getting rid of the receptor of these cells uh, that uh, HIV really uses as a doorway to enter the cells. And then the second types of changes are actually these single amino acid changes that we talked about already, which makes those cells uh, basically resistant to the HIV one if it, would, it were to enter. Now, the reason that, you know, we could have actually introduced the entire rhesus trim 5 into human cells and provided protection, but the rhesus trim 5 protein is so different from HIV, um, from human trim 5 that it would be recognized itself as a foreign object and, and those cells would be destroyed. So the key is to change the human trim 5 as little as possible so as to not trigger an immune response and still allow it to provide better protection. I hope that answered your question. Yes, I see a you. bunch of people have raised hands. I'm going to let uh, the club uh, president uh, choose who's, uh, who's answering the next, asking the next question. Uh, yes, so sure. So next, uh, we can have uh, Atre Malhar Vivak. You can ask a question. Yeah. Hi. It was a really nice talk. I enjoyed it. And uh, my question is, so you said that the proteins are uh, not really conserved at the, uh, if you consider the entire protein in between humans and other primates. Do you think that also is one of the reasons why um, it might like, does it have functional consequences at the front of also the autoimmunity aspects which you spoke about? Like, uh, I'm, I'm wondering why uh, the autoimmunity aspects might not be kicking in in terms of other primates who are, are already on the evolutionary peak versus uh, they might be kicking in. Yeah, I, th I mean, it's a really good question. I think what you're asking is that how much has of the uh, evolution of TRIM5 has been shaped by this pressure to, um, you know, restrict viruses versus uh, the pressure to avoid autoimmune effects. And the problem is that we cannot actually distinguish between these when we're looking at primate versions that are already present because they have already gone through those dual selections. But we can probably do this um, very kind of autoimmune focused study uh, by looking at um, how many trim 5 variants uh, basically induce this autoimmunity in cells by, again, introducing all possible mutations and seeing which ones of those are likely to be not tolerated because of their autoimmune effects. So trim 5 I didn't actually give you a lot of detail about trim 5 trim 5 is a E3 ubiquitin ligase. So its job is to actually bind other proteins and degrade it. And so in the case of capsid, it's super important to you know, uh, bind, uh, modify, ubiquitinate, and degrade the capsid protein of HIV-1. You could easily imagine that if I were to alter the, you know, protein recognition sequence of TRIM5, which is what I'm doing now with V1, there is a certain probability that that particular loop is going to start recognizing some human protein and degrade it. And if that protein happens to be important for cell viability or function, that particular variant will be extremely, almost like a suicidal gene. And so almost certainly those, those types of variants have been encountered by random mutation, but those would have been very, very quickly purged because those would have been extremely expensive to keep around. I don't know if that answers your question, but if yes, then maybe we move on to the next, next person with a question. Yep, thank you. I see Siddharth has a question. Go ahead, Siddharth. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, firstly, uh, thank you so much for such a fascinating talk. Uh, so I recently read about uh, mutational bias. And correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, it discussed how uh, the uh, epigenetic factors and even DNA repair can affect like what loci of the entire genome architecture is affected by uh, mutations in general. And in fact, it is not uh, random or stochastic. So do you think, uh, how do you think trim would fit in this model? Yeah, I think what you're referring to this uh, relatively recent study from Detlef Weigel who showed that yes, yes, gene coding yes, yes. regions are more protected. I mean, from a large large scale 
point of view, it actually works quite well because these are packaged in different histones, etc. Which is why the the DNDS type approach works quite well because we are literally using the same uh, sequences of the of, of of the gene, but just parsing it into nu you know nucleotide changes that alter amino acids versus keep the amino acid constant. So it's a beautiful internal control. So it's it would not be affected by genome wide fluctuation and mutational biases. I mean, the, the paper is actually quite nice because it actually uses mutation accumulation lines, mm -hmm. but we've actually known about genomic variation and mutation rates mm -hmm. in Drosophila and even in the human genome, simply by the rate at which uh, mobile elements accumulate mutations. You know, so for example, uh, mobile elements that sit on the Y chromosome that happen to land there and are, you know, become fossilized, they decay at a much faster rate on the Y chromosome than they do on the autosomes. And we've known that. And that has to do a little bit with the timing of replication um, and the uh, histone kind of profiles of the different parts of the genome. So I, in, in, a, in a sense, we would probably likely accumulate mutations, uh, genes like TRIM5-alpha, where we want some sort of adaptive potential to be in parts of the genome, like the subtelomeric regions and the centromeric regions, where there's a higher likely access to mutation, because that would be good. And that's actually largely true. So in the human genome, for example, if you look at what are the genes that are in the parts of the genome that are more likely to be mutating rapidly, many of them evolve immune receptors as well as odorant uh, receptors, which are important for your diversification of smell. Um, and those are the most rapidly evolving components of your genome. Right. Yeah, okay. Uh, I I mean, it, it's interesting how it fits well. I, mean, I like how like the past and like the, this, this recent article can come together. So it's a great insight. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. I think there's a question so, in the chat. Uh, what do you think about HIV virus regarding its virulence in future? Will it be eradicated or turn into a less fatal um, virus? I think uh, the the virulence of viruses uh, is a fascinating topic. Whether there's a, there's a lot of people who believe that uh, you know uh, we just need to wait long enough for like SARS-CoV-2 to become endemic and and therefore we lose. Um, but but actually, there's a lot of uh, uh, contrary evidence to that as well. It is true that many many years of coevolution are likely to select for less virulent versions of viruses and less pathogenic. Um, but, for example, there are SIV-related viruses in uh, primate populations like African green monkeys where the viral load is just as high in some HIV-infected humans. But the way the African green monkeys avoid severe disease is that they don't actually mount a severe immune response against HIV-1. So one of the, one of the really insidious things about things like HIV is that they actually infect the very immune cells that are required to protect against immunity in the first place. So as a result, when you were to mount a stringent immune response, you're actually making a lot more cells available to the virus. And in African green monkeys, the approach is to not have that many cells available for the virus. So you basically reach a kind of a negotiated truce, even with the virus kind of um, having high loads. However, the main thing that determines the virulence of the virus is how many new hosts can it infect? Um, so, for example, if a virus is in a population that's relatively sparse, it will evolve a virulence because being virulent will mean it'll kill its host and therefore go extinct itself. Um, unfortunately, the human population size is so large here that it would probably take a lot of intervention for us to hope that a current day virus is actually going to become a virulent because we are a lot of hosts that it can actually adopt by virtue of its virulence. So, it's a little bit of a hopeful strategy to just wait to see that SARS-CoV-2 is just going to naturally become a virulent. What is more likely that viruses like HIV and SARS-CoV-2, they will evolve to a state where they can actually maintain some sort of infection, just like seasonal coronaviruses do, where they can sort of not go extinct, but they just percolate at very low frequency in human populations. I don't know if I, there's no way for me to know if I answered your question or not. So if I didn't answer it, please ask it again. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I, there's somebody who's raised the hand. So please go ahead and ask your question. Yeah. Uh, hello. Uh, 
the talk was very interesting my question was like what would be the aspect of the same like here you were talking about the protein mutations in the pro- the protein how it can help in a, being a better uh, a challenge against virus how would uh, is there any studies in the activator region or promoter region in the dna like the more protein expression from the same protein can create a better uh, challenge against virus Anything this related? is an excellent question uh, i appreciate the question very much there is actually a lot of evidence that in fact we can alter the uh, expression level of the protein and uh, and accomplish in acute cases very much the same benefit but like i was saying you know trim 5 is a, a all immune proteins but especially trim 5 are a double edged sword it's really great to actually have access to them so in the face of a pathogenic virus it's really great to over express them but the more you over express them the more costly it becomes for the organism because the autoimmune effects go up so in a sense um over expressing them or changing the uh, promoter enhancer regions are a really good solution but they are probably not a good long term solution because of the expense associated with this high production of a potentially expensive protein so in, over the course of evolution we tend to see that changes in protein coding genes that refine the specificity tend to dominate but in the short term with experimental evolution that we do with viruses in the lab we do see evidence for um, changes at the both in the promoter and enhancer but we also see changes in the 3 prime utr that lower their susceptibility to micro rna depletion so all of these accomplish the same thing that they actually make more mrna and therefore more protein this thank you thank you i don't see oh there's there is another question uh with covid virus rapidly evolving beating vaccines is is it possible to use this concept in generating vaccine using the plateau peak uh this is the hope we are far behind because we don't actually have good delivery mechanism so it's probably better for the time being to actually focus on the adaptive immune strategies but what my colleagues who are kind of using the same kind of deep mutational scanning approaches are doing is they're kind of trying to see where the virus might go next in the face of the vaccines that they are actually encountering so you can essentially um either evolve viruses in the laboratory which is a little bit dangerous given how dangerous this virus is uh, already or you can do this deputational scanning approach to identify which um viral spike proteins can become resistant to detection from the vaccination induced antibodies which is a much easier thing and there's a lot of people who are actually doing that in fact the uh, omicron and delta variants but especially delta was completely predicted that that is what we are likely to get as a result of the initial stage of vaccination and that is you know exactly what we got so we can predict in the laboratory the the path that the virus is going to take and the hope is that if we can predict the virus uh, path with high confidence we can already have prepared um a vaccination strategy that would actually preempt that virus from taking over so for for now the arms race we are kind of uh several steps behind but by anticipating the evolutionary potential of the viruses we might be able to actually come up with much better um preemptive vaccination strategies so sort of like a cocktail of vaccines where we we go after the current virus but also actually introduce something that would go after future versions of the virus I think that answered the question again I'm not sure but if if it it didn't please ask me again and I don't see any hands raised or uh chat questions so I I'm going to hang out just to make sure that I've answered all your questions but I also appreciate that it's super late there I'm actually impressed that more than 30 of you are still here um I guess I've forgotten what it, it mean, means to be in my 20s I I definitely would not be staying up this late to listen to a seminar Yeah, it's a pleasure, sir, to hear it too. Uh, so, do we have any more questions from the audience? Um, if not, I think we can wind up. All right. Well, again, okay. it's a pleasure. Thanks, Proteus, and uh, good luck with all of your studies. I hope all of you are doing well. I know that COVID has disrupted a lot of plans and 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 London plans, but. 
hang in there and like find good support structures around you sure sir so once again i would like to extend our heartiest gratitude to professor malik for the extremely interesting talk and i would like to thank everyone who attended this talk and got actively involved in the interactive session i extend my gratitude to our faculty advisor dr sadananda singh and the school of biology for their continued support towards proteus uh, so wishing everyone a really great day ahead and do keep track of the various events that we have planned thank you thank you bye bye sir